Hello, this episode provides an introduction and overview about agriculture in developing countries. In thinking about the contributions of agriculture to economic development, one of the first contributions to this came from the late Nobel laureate Simon Kuznet. He introduced a four-part schema. Here, he was thinking about industrialization as being synonymous with the development goal. But nonetheless, despite this, he still gave a central importance to agriculture in making that process possible. The first was the product contribution, perhaps easiest to understand and appreciate that products grown in the agricultural sector, ranging from cotton used for manufacturing shirts to foods that are used in the food processing industry, so that foods available also in urban areas, these represent direct contributions, specific direct physical contributions of agriculture to industry. There's also a foreign exchange contribution. In order to industrialize, it's almost always necessary to import capital goods from other countries, from advanced countries. To do so, you need foreign exchange. One already has, as a low-income country, an agricultural sector. So from that sector may come the possibilities of exports to generate foreign exchange that in turn allow a country to make needed imports for industrialization, as stressed by Simon Kuznets. There's also a market contribution. This is very important. It's not usually possible to sell all of your manufactured output as you begin to develop and expand manufacturing abroad. Exports often play a very important and central role, as we'll see when we look at chapter 12. However, it's also very important to sell domestically. In order to do that, you need buyers of the product. We'll see that in low-income countries, the fraction of workers who are in the agricultural area can be well over 70%, so that if you want to have a market, it needs to be among rural agricultural people. Thus, you have to raise their incomes enough so they can do so. In order to raise their incomes, it's necessary to invest in this sector and raise the productivity of workers in that sector. Finally, we have the factor contribution. It's the most complex of these four. The first is the labor contribution, and this doesn't just mean um, some by fiat saying workers will now move out of agriculture and go to manufacturing. Rather, the idea is that by investing in agriculture, labor productivity in agriculture goes up sufficiently so that it really makes economic sense so that some of the labor is reallocated as are our earnings opportunities in the manufacturing sector. The capital contribution is perhaps most subtle of these. It's not about taking capital out of the agricultural sector. First, there has to be investment in the agricultural sector to increase its productivity for all the reasons that we have seen. Once development um, proceeds to some level, some of the profits of our now more productive agriculture can be reinvested in other activities, even as some of it is reinvested in agriculture. So these are the contributions, even for industrialization. So agriculture still accounts for the largest number of workers in the developing country labor force, especially for low-income countries. The infor informal sector labor force will soon surpass this number, but it will remain very important. In most developing countries, though, agriculture accounts for a much lower share of total output than accounts for its labor force share. This suggests that agricultural productivity is lower than productivity is in other sectors in an economy. Agricultural production is rising throughout the developing world, but unevenly, and a particular challenge here is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Here we have a set of estimates from the World Bank on grain yields across different developing regions in the period 1960 to 2005. We see rather dramatic gains in the developed countries in this period. Nonetheless, also very rapid gains and catch-up, process of catching up, though with a lag, on the part of 
sub on the part of Asian developing countries and also of countries in the LAC region, Latin America and the Caribbean. African productivity has grown much more slowly. So we have here the years and on the y-axis we have yield. In this case, yield is defined as tons per hectare. Yield is defined in different ways, but always tells basically the same story. In very recently in 2019, Xu and Xiaohua did a study of yield trends by region now going in the period 1961 to 2017. They used some somewhat different methods. They found a broadly similar story. These are the Americas, which have had continued productivity gains throughout this period. Yield is defined here in terms of kilogram per hectare. It gives it a different scale, but it's the same idea. We have, and following the North America case, Asia, um, Europe, moving along at a similar pace along with the rest of the Americas, lagging behind is Sub-Saharan Africa. Fortunately, there is some progress in recent years due to a focus on the so-called New Green Revolution for Africa, which is described in the text. Looking across countries, we can see the dramatic differences in agricultural productivity defined here as value added per worker. These are 2017 data and value added per worker is just about $600 in low income countries, a little over $3,000 in middle income countries and a little over $40,000 in high income countries. So this is a rather dramatic difference. Less dramatic is the difference in yield. The yield in terms here of kilograms per hectare, again, 1,542 for low income countries, 3,889 for middle income, and 6,062 for the high income countries. This reflects the much higher use of labor in agriculture. That is to say, there are many more workers per hectare, and this accounts for the fact that even though productivity differs substantially in this dimension, it's not as dramatic as the agricultural productivity difference. Here we have a range of countries that you can look at. This is in the text showing that agricultural productivity in value added per worker ranges from two or 300, $400 in some countries to 93,110 in the highest country in this dimension, Canada. So with that background, we can look at some of the stylized facts with the data in the background. Here we have GDP per capita on the x-axis, while on the y-axis we have the share of labor in agriculture and also the share of GDP in agriculture. This higher blue best fitting curve represents the share of labor in agriculture in the period in question. And one can see a very strong downward sloping relationship, as we know as being one of the stylized facts of economic development described in chapter three in the study of patterns of economic development. But what we can see is that among the essentially lowest income countries here, we may have well over 80% of the people engaged in farming. Whereas at what is essentially the highest income countries, it's GDP per capita, we have among the developing countries in a number of cases, the share of labor in agriculture being well below 10%. So this is downward sloping. Also downward sloping, but well below it, is the share of GDP coming from agriculture. So this is this difference in share of labor force and share of GDP reflecting the lower productivity in the agricultural sector. And so we can see that this has the relationship of the patterns of development that we know that also as essentially income per capita rises, so also is there a decline in the share of GDP that comes from the agricultural sector as there's a shift to 
industry and to services. Also of interest in this diagram are several special cases, three in particular that we will look at. The first has to do with a share of labor in agriculture for the case of China. This is over the years 1961 to 2003. And we see that it is indeed downward sloping, but is relatively flat. The economy clearly has grown a lot. We can see that GDP per capita has grown very substantially in this 1961 to 2003 period. But labor force has shown a decline with respect to working in agriculture, but not a very strong one. People still remain for the large part in rural areas. This changed in this century rather dramatically. For the case in Nigeria, we see that there's a very substantial fall through this period of 1961 to 2003 in the fraction of workers in agriculture. However, income did not grow very quickly in this period. This represented a movement of people out of agriculture and into low productivity services, suggesting the relative neglect of agriculture. It had something to do with the effects of the focus on oil exports, a topic for much later in the text. Here we have the case for Brazil in the same period, 1961 to 2003. Here we see a dramatic drop in the share of the workforce engaged in agriculture, really quite dramatic. It included a period of very rapid growth between roughly 1964 and 1982, not quite as dramatic as China's growth, but nonetheless very rapid, but it was followed by a period of relative stagnation with the lost decade of development from the debt crisis and so on, some increase in growth as we look at these last years. So that within this broad spectrum, specific country experiences can vary very much. And so with that, we'll end this episode.